Let's clap our hands to the Lord, Dunamaker. I agree with Marty in that Sunday was a very, very powerful service. And but I, you know, every Sunday lately has been, and uh, and we just need to continue moving in that direction. And uh, you know, remember growing up and through most of my life, you'd have every now and then you'd have a good service. Uh, but uh, here lately, we just had good services. Period. And uh, the altar service was refreshing and awesome. People were being filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the altar. That's real revival. And uh, we got a baptismal service coming up here. We're going to baptize a bunch of folks. I got a baby dedication. We got folks getting baptized, babies getting dedicated, people getting filled with the Holy Ghost. Doesn't get any much better than that unless somebody wants to buy my supper. So that's good. So um, I didn't get any volunteers. Didn't get a single lady man on that. So I guess supper's on me. So Jeremiah chapter 29. Good to see you. Let's let our guests know we're glad to have them. Look at that crew of young people walking out here. I'm just glad I'm standing here and not going where they're going. But what a wonderful group of kids. I think in the history of this church, that's our biggest group, and they'll have 40 kids up there tonight, and that's pretty awesome. So young people, not counting their children. Jeremiah chapter 10, for thus says the Lord. Everybody say, for thus says the Lord. That's a powerful thing. It wasn't the judge. It wasn't the governor. It wasn't the president. It wasn't the mayor. It wasn't your dad or your mom or your preacher. The Lord said it. That means we ought to stop and make sure we pay close attention. Closer attention to those words than words spoken by anybody else in the universe. When the Lord says it, those are the most important words. Amen? For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, he was speaking to a nation that was in captivity. These folks have been captive, and so he was giving them hope in the middle of their captivity. I will visit you and perform my good work toward you. I like that second part. I don't like that 70 years, but I like that good work. And cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Verse number 12, all the way through 14. Then you will, then, when, when I come and visit you, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. It's too bad it takes 70 years before we listen. Too bad we got to have a disaster in our life before we pray to him. But we're all that way, aren't we? People don't come to church because they won the lottery. People come to church because they went broke or got divorced or lost a loved one or a job. But that's just the way we are. You will seek me and find me when, when you search for me. If you look for him, you're going to find him. He's not hiding from you. When you will seek me and find me, when you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you, says the Lord. The Lord said, says the Lord, the Lord said, if you'll look for me with all your heart, you'll find me. That's a promise, isn't it? And I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I've driven you. This wasn't just a prophecy. This was a dual prophecy. This wasn't just a prophecy about Babylonian captivity. This was a prophecy of the end time. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I've driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to this place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. Man. Thank God there's always a light at the end of the tunnel, and that light is not an oncoming train. It's the presence of the Lord. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. 
Anybody in here ever played video games? Uh, it's been a long time. Some of you just are doing it right now on your cell phone. I should ask how many of you are playing video games right now. But, but uh, I was watching a uh, video game, uh, and uh, it wasn't too long ago. Brock was playing it, and the object of the game I don't play video games anymore, I, 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 but I noticed that the object of the game was pretty obvious. You kill as many of them as you possibly can, as fast as you possibly can. Kill as many of the bad guys as you can possibly kill as in as short a period of time as possible. And uh, sometimes life is like that. Sometimes we think life is defeating as many of the opposition as we can as quickly as we can. We think life's stomping on somebody else so we can exalt ourselves. Sometimes we think life is, and I, we live in a corporate structure in America. We live in the most uh, materialistic society in the world's ever known. And, and the way you get ahead in this world and in, in, a, in a corporation is about stomping on somebody else and getting their job. And, and we live in that dog-eat-dog, let-the-big-dog-eat kind of world. And uh, I had a, had a little golden retriever, and she, was, she weighed about 50 pounds, 40 or 50 pounds. And I had a big old bull mastiff, and he weighed 150-plus, 160 pounds. And, and uh, uh, she would growl at him once in a while when we poured the food in the bowl. He didn't make any difference. We should growl at him or not. He's going to start eating because that didn't bother him too much. And we look at life a lot like that. And because we look at life thinking everybody's out to get us and we're out to get everybody else, we get this thing stuck in our mind. And this is where religion plays a big part in this. We get this thing stuck in our mind that God is out to get us. God's not out to get you. God's out to help you. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 28 is a shocking scripture. And we know. And the problem is, is we don't know. Whoever wrote that, they knew. Paul knew and the folks with Paul knew. But we don't know. Leave that scripture up for just a while, Tim. We know what? We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, there's, I've heard this preached wrong all my life. It didn't say that all things are good. It says that all things work together for good. I was talking to my office a little bit ago about, and I, I preached a sermon about a long time ago, if I, if I was to hand you a, a teaspoonful of salt, uh, and say, boy, do you like salt? Well, I like salt, but I don't, I, I don't like it like that. If I, it, it, do you like baking powder? How about a big old cup full of baking powder or, or some Martha White flour? How about two cups of flour? You want to eat some? Does, d- d- how about uh, uh, any of that sound good? Doesn't sound very good. Does anybody like buttermilk? You're weird if you do. My, I, I, my, I like buttermilk with cornbread crushed up in it, but I'm not much of a buttermilk drinker. But but you take salt and flour and baking soda and buttermilk and you give it to my granny and she'd make the best biscuits. She'd have the whole smell and you couldn't wait to eat them because she mixed things that by themselves weren't real good, but you mix those things together and it didn't. Be, you couldn't beat it. And it makes my mouth water right now just thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. And then she would leave them. You know, we'd, she'd pick a big pan about 4.30 in the morning and with some salt pork. Anybody ever had salt pork? Yeah, that's good stuff. And what she'd do is what was left over after breakfast, that was your snack. And after you're doing your chores and you wanted to come in for a snack, you'd go get you one of them cold biscuits and slap a piece of that salt pork in it. How many of you are ready for that right now? Yeah, that's good stuff. But those sort of those things made life good. And it doesn't matter if it's bad or if it's good. And I said it a bunch. The worst things are the best things sometimes because they turn you to God. 
in the recipe of life, all things, the things that taste bad and the things that taste good, mix together. They work together for good. Didn't say they are good, but they work for good. You mean my divorce could be good? You mean my financial trouble could be good? If you love God, God's mixing it together. My question is, anybody love God? You wouldn't be here if you didn't. So he's mixing it together. It smells good. It smells like Granny's kitchen. And that's, you just got to understand, he's still working on me. I'm not what I ought to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. And he's, all things are working together for good, and life is not a Nintendo game. All things. Amen. What the Bible is, is it's not God attacking man. It's God supporting man. It's not God telling you the do's and don'ts. The Bible's not a book of do's and don'ts. It's a love story. Because if you love, then you just automatically do some things out of love that you wouldn't do normally. The Bible's a love letter written in blood. <laughs> Come on now. I love you so much I dipped my pen in my own blood and wrote this to you. And it's filled with support, not condemnation, not damnation, not judgment, but it's filled with support. Encouragement and hope. And it's as if the Lord is speaking to you. And I thought about it. If the Bible could say anything, what would be the greatest thing that Marty could say to me that would encourage me as a pastor or as a friend or anything? Brother Jack, as my brother in the Lord, what could, what could Jack say to me? And Jack said it to me, and it encourages me. But the things that I could say to, to Jones that would encourage Jones, if I could say anything, I could say, Jones, I love you, and he knows I love him, and that, 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 that's good. That's a good thing to say. But what I could say to Jones is, is, Jones, I believe in you. The greatest words that I could say to a friend is, I believe in you. And what the Bible is saying is, and what the Lord's saying to us, hey, you, gonna, you make some mistakes, but in the end, it's going to work for good. I believe in you. Everything's going to be all right. And it's encouraging to me. The Lord believed in me enough to die for me when I was still stuck in my trespasses and my sins. And I really think God believes in us. I think he has confidence. I think God has more faith in us than we have in us. What do you think? <laughs> I know the plans I have for you. Man, writing a letter of encouragement to a nation in exile. You may be having a bad day. And I never understood my uh, what it meant to pick low cotton until my kid's grandmother told me about you would that's what she had when she was a kid she had this long 20 foot sack she drug behind her and you you pick the cotton off the top of the plant that was easy she said but the hardest job was getting bending over and it wasn't as good and it was harder to get and and uh, I used to hear them saying, well, I've, I've been picking low cotton. That means I've had a bad day. I never understood what that meant until they explained that to me. But you may be picking low cotton, but he believes in you. He has plans for you. and He knows what those plans are, beautiful promises. That he's going to deliver you and he's going to gather you from all the earth and he's going to restore you and he's going to, it doesn't really matter what's happening today, 
The picture's bigger than that. The recipe's better than that. It's not just a spoonful of salt. It's going to be all right. Matthew chapter 5, and I, I'm going to read quickly and the whole, a little bit. I just, I got time, so I want to, this is a little bit of a Bible study, so I want to read it. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. Listen to these words. He's the greatest sermon ever preached. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Isn't that just a treasure trove? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. <laughs> well, you say this when, when everybody's picking on you. You ought to be happy about that. Is that what that says? When everybody's persecuting you and talking about you and telling and, and accusing, rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. Uh-oh, stop right here. But if the salt loses its flavor... What good is salt if it don't taste like salt? What is salt? Salt's is a preservative. Salt's, what good is salt if it's not salt? How should it be seasoned? And if then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men? Verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. This little light of mine, I'm going. This is my third service in a row to sing. Remember, we what we do when we kids shine all over Arkansas. I'm going to let it shine. Ain't going to let the devil blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. Y'all stand up and do that, and then we can do Father Abraham too. <laughs> Tanya, would you come lead us, Father Abraham? I'm just kidding. No, they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lamp stand. Why would you light a lamp and put it under a basket? Why would you do that? There's no reason. You light a lamp and you put it on a lamp stand, and it gives light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. What was he really saying to his disciples? He was sitting on a hillside speaking to his disciples. What was he really saying to them? He's really saying, I believe in you. This is who you are. You're the salt. You're the light. Don't lose your savor. Don't put your light under a bushel. I trust you to carry my message into the world. I believe in you. He would have never left if he hadn't have believed in somebody. And so he encouraged them. The Bible's a book of encouragement. If you believe that, say amen. You can make a difference. You can preserve. You can brighten. You can savor. You can give you can give flavor to a dull, boring world. You can only go to so many parties and have so much fun before you got to try to find something else. There's a part of us that only Jesus can satisfy. And the world's looking for real Christians that can be that saver, can bring that satisfaction. Anybody like green beans? Anybody like french fries? You don't like french fries. You know why you eat french fries? Because they hold salt and ketchup. 
you like salt and ketchup and you use french fries as a tool to get it. <laughs> Good preaching right there. That's deep doctrine. My pastor talked about salt and ketchup. You can make a difference. We can make a difference. You can make a difference. And can I bring it on down a little bit? We better make a difference. He didn't say you can be the salt of the earth. He said you already are. You're the salt of the earth. Do you have savor? Do you have flavor or not? You are the salt. You are the light. Are you under a bushel or are you on a candlestick? Are you full of flavor and savor or are you not? You are the salt of the earth. And the church is the salt of the earth. You already are the light of the world. Without you, the world's going to be in darkness. That's what he's telling them. I'm going to go away. And without you, the world's going to be a dark place. God help us. God help us accept our responsibilities and receive the encouragement the Lord's offering us out of his word. There's, you know, the least favorite word in the world. The greatest words in the world are, I believe in you. But I think the most the word I've been asked not to use more than any other word, whether it's in a wedding ceremony or in church, is obedience. You can't imagine how many future wives have said, don't say that part about obey your husband. I'll say whatever you want me to say, but I feel sorry for him. I can say, husbands, obey your wife if you want me to. I'm just going to read out of the Bible. Oh, actually, I wouldn't do that, but Jesus told them in that sermon that your success, and this is where we really don't want to go. All of us want to be successful. All of us want to be light. All of us want to be salt. But he said your success depends on your obedience. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Because if you're not obedient, you are salt and you lose your savor. You are light, but you put it under a bushel. And you lose your effectiveness because of your lack of obedience. And so we better, we better obey the Lord. We better listen to the word of the Lord. If the Lord speaks to you, and it, the Lord speaks to us in the salt. He speaks to us in the flour. He speaks to us in the buttermilk. He speaks to us in the things that are not, not necessarily good, don't taste good to us. Anybody ever get a whipping by your daddy and they say, it's going to hurt me worse than it hurts you? My daddy said that a lot and he never believed a word. I still don't believe it. Because those whippings hurt. Mama's whippings didn't hurt until the plastic came off the flask water and she swung at me with that little metal strap. That hurt some. I remember when I was 15 years old, I folded my arms. My mom was whipping me, and I just stood there and laughed. She whipped me every day. You had to get over it eventually. But, but you know what she said when I stood there and laughed? She said, I'm going to tell your daddy when he gets home. Oh, Bobby, you're killing me. I started crying then. <laughs> it started hurting real bad. <laughs> uh, but that wasn't good for me, but it worked together for good for me. Nobody wants to get told what to do, and nobody wants to be obedient, but when we are corrected and when we are told and when we, it works for good. 
And for us to carry out the commission of the Lord, we're going to have to be obedient. We're going to have to listen to him. We're going to have to obey him. And by doing that, he puts his confidence and his trust and his faith in us to accomplish his will in the earth. He isn't here. He sent back his ghost, his spirit to live in our hearts. We are his hands. We are his feet. He's got confidence. He believes in us to get the job done. He believes in us a lot of times more than we believe in us. Look at scripture, Hebrews chapter 13. Just a little promise. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I, he didn't say I'm going to leave you when you're bad and I'm going to be with you when you're good. He said, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. Because when you need me, when you're ready to repent, when you're ready to turn around, when you're ready to change your ways, I'm, I, I've never left. I'm still there waiting. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. Can you go back? I will not fear. What can man do to me? God believes in me. He's my helper. He's always with me. What can man do to me? Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. What can man do to me? Well, I made mistakes. Yeah, we all make mistakes. But he's my helper. Man. The promise is I'll never leave you or forsake you. And what is our right? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 speaks to our right to receive that. For all the promises in him are yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. It is our right to receive his promise. He didn't base that promise on you or how good or how bad you did. He based that promise on that man that hung on the tree and how good or how bad he did. And the way I see it, he did pretty good. That is a promise you can lay claim on no matter what. Put that scripture back up, Tim. I'm sorry. The promises of God are yes and amen. Can I have that promise? Yes. Can I have that promise? As Brother Jack says, Amen. Can you have that promise? Can I get an amen? You ever read something in the book? You ever heard something preached from the pulpit? Say, I want that for me. All you got to do is ask him, and he says yes. All you got to do is ask him, he says amen. What does amen mean? I agree with you. <laughs> so when you say something, God says Amen. I believe God's saying amen in this sermon tonight. The promise I'll never leave you, forsake you. Let's talk about it just for a second. I'll be done and just uh, you'll be out early tonight. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll just look that up in good old common English. I didn't look it up in the Greek or the Hebrew or the Aramaic or any of those. I just looked it up in English. I hope that's okay. And the word leave means to withdraw or to drop. I'll never withdraw myself from you. I'll never drop you from my family tree. I'm always going to be there with you. Forsake means to abandon or desert. And I'm not talking about pecan pie. That's my 21-day 21 fast is giving up sweets and it's killing. Regina's giving up chocolate. Somebody was giving up Facebook. That would be hard for me. AJ's giving up Facebook. <laughs> yeah, that's what it was. Uh, and then some of you, you know, I, I don't want you to raise your hand, but if you went on that 24-hour complete fast, what a blessing. But he said, I'm never going to withdraw, I'm never going to drop, I'm never going to abandon, I'm never going to desert you, no matter what, my promises are yes 
and their amen, and I'm always going to be there, and my gifts and my callings are without repentance. And at the point you try to you decide I'm going to turn around and I'm going to about face and I'm going to repent, my calling and my election is right back on your shoulders. Your, my promises are still there for you. Nothing has been, I will. it will be like the canker worm and the palmer worm never ate up those years. I will restore those years to you. Those are all promises that I'll restore the years of canker worm and the palmer worm. The, and I'm going to put you in a position where it'll be like it never happened. God said, uh, those are promises, and he said those promises are those are yes promises and amen promises, but those promises are based on my obedience. He's not going to bless me so I can be a problem. He's not going to bless me so I can hurt somebody. He's going to bless me so I can bless somebody. He believes in us, but we've got to obey him in order for him to work through us and with us. I'm so glad that he believes in us. And I'm so glad that he puts his confidence in us. And I'm so glad that he has not withdrawn himself from me because there's been times of when at my own I made mistakes and those and they were my fault and there wasn't any denying it. And I people withdrew from me, but the presence of the Lord never left. Come on, somebody. When everybody else leaves you, he's a friend that sticks it closer than a brother. That's a yes and amen promise. And I've got a brother that would die for his brother, that i got the best brother in the world. But the, the Bible says that the Lord's closer than a brother. Oh, man. I like those kind of promises, don't you? Those I believe in you kind of promises. When somebody believes in you, you can take on the world. Man. You can fight a grizzly bear. Pardon the pun. <laughs> Mike's not here tonight, but his wife says, so tell him I talked about bears again tonight. He killed a bear Saturday, I think. So. But you can, you, you can take on the world when somebody believes in you. And the whole world can abandon you and withdraw themselves from me, but Jesus says, I believe in you so much that I wrote you a letter, a love letter in blood. I believe in you. Well, I don't even know if I believe in myself. That doesn't matter. Somebody better than you, higher than you, that created you believes in you. Somebody breathed in you, the breath. He, he, he believes in you. I, may, I, may be, so I, I still believe in you. Coach pat you on the rear and say, go get him, Whitley. I know you can do it. Or he can grab you by your shirt and say, don't you go out there and mess up. And you went out there scared. But if he patted you on the rump and said, go do it, and you're, let him away. Coach, trust me. Coach, believes me. Give me the ball. Man. Hebrews 13 and 6, and I'll finish give him that one I can tell Hebrews 13 and 6 so we may boldly say the Lord is my helper my best James Earl Jones voice which was still pretty terrible so we may boldly say the Lord is my helper and because he's my helper I will not fear What can man do to me? Hmm. Stand with me. Some of you here tonight, it's your first time. Some of you have been here for 16 years. It makes no difference. Some of you, the worst mistake you made was last week. Some of you, it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Makes no difference. Some of you in the middle of a trial. Some of you are having the best days of your life. God looks at us all the same. As I said a thousand times, the ground beneath the cross is level. And everybody stands on level ground there. 
We all have a chance in the kingdom because he really believes in us. You don't have to be raised in church to be a Christian. You don't have to be raised in church to be a conqueror. You don't have to be raised in church to accomplish something in the kingdom. You have to be, you don't have to, you don't have to win the memory verse contest to make your life count. This is our, this is our day. This is the finest opportunity the church has ever had. If we don't accomplish it, then it's our fault. And we could preach like that, but the truth is God believes in us and he thinks we can. He put us in this central position in this in this amazing community we live in and this he put us in this position for a reason. Because he believes in us. Let's get to work. Let's get her done. You glad you came to church tonight? Let's raise our hands and worship the Lord together. Lord, I love you. We are already your salt and we are already your light. And we we want to walk in obedience. We want to follow where you lead us, Lord, today. And fulfill your will in this world. Don't let us fail. Help us to understand the recipe and the things that are going on and the reason for it all and that in the end, as long as we'll stay faithful, you'll exalt us and make us like you and join heirs forever and eternity. So many things that we fail at and we fall short, but it's a comfort to know that you're always there. You're always with us. You've never left us. You've never deserted us. You've never forsaken us. We can count on that. We can count on that. When the world has sunk around us and everybody has abandoned us, we can count on it that you're still there. You're still with us. And you always will be. And just waiting on our obedience, waiting on our repentance, waiting on us to acknowledge who you are to worship you. And so we worship you tonight as incomplete people. We worship you tonight as people that are unable to succeed on our own. We worship you tonight as completely dependent people. We couldn't draw another breath if you didn't allow. We couldn't take another step. And so we worship you not only as our creator but as our provider. You're the all-sufficient one. You're Jehovah Jireh. You you, You make everything possible, and we worship you for that. We understand the calling and responsibility you've laid on our shoulders and accept that. We breathe your air and we want to fulfill your will. Help us and forgive us of our sins. Search us. Hmm. Hmm. Come on, somebody, let's pray tonight. Don't just listen to me pray. Would you pray, Lord, forgive me, help me. Use me. Make me what you want me to be. Lead me. Hallelujah. I love you, Lord. If you love him, say amen real loud. I think he just said amen right back to you. I think I just heard him say amen to you. I think I heard him just say yes to you. Could we just give him a little bit of wonderful praise here tonight? Come on. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You be listening. You be attentive. He's trying to talk to you. He wants to use you. You be listening. So good to to have you on Wednesday night. Good to have our new friends here tonight. Amen. And uh, praise the Lord. Good to have my old friend Jack back. Jack needs cell phones to take back to Africa. If you've got old cell phones and you don't bring them, then he's not praying for you anymore. So we need all your old cell phones, and uh, he can. That's, he can. Those are very valuable over there, and that helps him provide for his ministry. So if you have an old cell phone or two around, broken screen or not, it don't matter. Bring it, and uh, it'll be a blessing to Brother Jack. 
we're going to receive an offering for him on Sunday, so you'll be praying about that. And we pledged a lot of money to him this year. We're going to send him back to Africa with a be a blessing to him. So, so I'm uh, excited about all that. I just want to be a part of the kingdom, whether it's in Ghana, Africa, or if it's in Bryan, Arkansas. I just want to be part of the kingdom. And uh, and uh, if you're interested in baptism, you need to see me. Uh, if you're interested in attending a class on Sunday in my office about that, we had a wonderful class this past Sunday. You let me know. Just a lot of exciting things. If you're interested in ministry and getting more involved, this is the time to do it. If you're so involved you can't find time for anything else to do, we can still give you some more to do. So uh, it's time to get busy for the kingdom. I'm glad I came to church tonight. The offering basket is in the back if you'd like to give tonight. Uh, we we uh, respectfully request that our guests don't give. We're just glad you're here. But this is for our members to give and tithe. We thank you for being here. God bless you. We'll see you on Sunday morning. And bring somebody to church with you.